as close as possible. Okay? Is that as close as you can get your handle? Right. Stuff coming out of my riser. What's that? Riser's full here. I can't hear you. That riser came full out there. Yeah. Let's put some more in it. Iron pole. That's pretty much what I expected it to be. Two people was a little lighter than I thought it'd be. Yeah, but it's way too heavy for one. <laughs> yeah, you can't handle it. Come on down with it. Three inches thick. Uh, about two and a three quarters. And probably ten inches diameter. Maybe nine. I have to wait till it cools down. Well, guys, these are the two rails that we cast. <laughs> uh, Steve's just going to take them back with the risers on them and. How you gonna cut them off? Put them on my dual 26 inch hydraulic table. All right. And cut right through my cot butter. So anyway, and I forgot <laughs> we didn't weigh these, but you said they weigh about how much a piece? Should have been 56 pounds in this part. Yeah, 
Yeah, of course we we had more than that tied up in the risers and the uh, runners. We almost doubled it. Yep. Yeah, you can, you can yeah. come right here. Well, I was going to get your sign so you could scoot in. Well, it's my channel, so they'll know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they'll know what so. it is. Hello, guys. Uh, I want to introduce you to Steve Watkins. He's from Houston, Texas. Uh, we cast two huge rails at, I forgot how many pounds a piece. 56 pounds. It's six pounds, and that's, uh, we probably doubled that in risers and gating. So we were probably pouring close to 100 pounds and all. Uh, and anyway, uh, one turned out better than the other. We had a little, and it looks like we had some inclusions on the uh, iron and uh, on, on one of them, but this, the other one turned out good, and Steve assured me, that, oh, that's gonna be cut out of there anyway, so as long as he can use them, I feel good about it. Yeah, this was just, I work with straight edges this long all the time, and as long as I can get it on my planer, and there's enough metal, we'll true it up. Yeah, speaking of which, if you uh, would like to see some good metal planing videos, check out his channel. He, uh, he's got a Rockford 19, 43. 43 open face. They call it an open face yeah. planer. Single arm. Yeah, it comes out to one side. It's not like a lot of the older ones where you got a bridge. It goes all the way across or a gantry. And uh, But anyway, this is a beast, and he cut some serious chips on it. He does a lot of the straight edges, and you could actually mill a lathe bed on this thing if it's uh, not hardened. It's got a eight-foot travel. Yeah. So. And that's, I guess, this project is for a uh, hardened bed lathe. So he's not going to be able to actually use the planer on that that job. He's going to actually have to uh, rig up a railing system made out of these cast iron rails for a trolley to ride on, if I understood you right. Yep. This is going to go on uh, <coughs> bolt on the side of a Monarch 10 EE lathe. Uh -huh. And it's got a hardened bed and... I don't want to tear the whole thing apart, so I'm trying to come up with a system of bolting these rails to the side, perfectly aligning them, and then putting a heavy trolley cart with a grinder on it and an indicator base. Yeah. So you can measure as you go. Okay. And don't have to tear the whole thing apart. If it works, save myself a lot of trouble. Yeah. If it doesn't work, yeah. I'll yeah. find it. Uh. I hope it'll work for yeah. you, especially after all the work we put into this. <laughs> yep. Well, guys, uh, that's it. I just wanted to introduce you to Steve. Steve, thanks for coming out. Hope Thank you have a you safe for trip back. Me. I'll be thinking about planning this all the way home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm anxious to see pictures of it. And, guys, uh, if once Steve does that, I'll see if I can get him to shoot me some pictures, and I'll add that. Good deal. Thank you. Yep. Bye, guys. Well, that was a half inch thick and had to drill it out with uh, the hole saw here and it started slipping on me. It doesn't have one of those locking cog deals. It's threaded and it's stripped out, so my beautiful weld held. I got some special rod for welding stainless to steel and that's what I use with this since these uh, hole saws are so brittle. I will admit it did break on me one time after I welded it and had to re-weld it, but this stuff's pretty good, whatever it is. Now I just got to get this piece out. So this is a half inch thick steel plate and it's just laying down on a tripod of pipe that sticks out that's been welded to the sides. and. That's your Twir inlet, and what I just cut here is going to be the tap for uh, when it accumulates enough iron to the point I've got a bath of it down below the Twir. I can knock the clay bot out and drain it, and then put a new bot back in it and not have this thing accumulate with all that iron. Work on getting the forming made for this now, and that's going to take all day if not tomorrow as we form it up and then with you know this is something I never really talk about but refractory you have to 
you can't have any kind of porous material against it or it'll absorb it like a wick and create weak spots you don't want that uh, we'll be putting silicone down around this ring along with plugging the holes and from there we'll start uh, forming it up and then ramming everything I'll show you that when we get closer to that point I got the entire lining chipped out if I haven't mentioned that already spent most of the day yesterday making the core which is this piece here and it's got slightly it's slightly conical it's a little bigger on this top end than it is on the bottom now this starts out as a piece of thorn tube that you would get at Home Depot or Lowe's and since it had to be conical I started off by cutting those slits on four places and then I made this wooden ring as a spreader ring to give me the shape that I wanted and the only reason I'm doing this is to try to keep the side clearance of the the thermos mass between the thermos mass and the crucible parallel as parallel as possible now I'm you know it's, it's not going to be exact to the crucible's profile so from there I uh, so, so all I did to start this with is I took and ripped on the table saw down to about two inches from the, the end of this first tube. There are several factors that you got to fix. Uh, one is when you're spreading this out like that, you're going to have roundness issues. It, it, it's going to look like an egg as you deform it like this. So you need to add like a three-ply as I did to this one of extra form tube and it I just use the same size form tube now once I put this this inner piece in once I had it established then I take a second piece form tube the same length I rip it one time and I glue put glue all over the first piece in between them I guess and I slide it down in that next piece and I I band it real tight to help it conform to the first tube. Now when you do that, you're going to have a V-shaped gap on one side. So you have to cut. Uh, I usually have a leftover piece, like six inches, four inches, it doesn't matter how long it is. And you just start filling in the gap with little triangular pieces all the way up. Then you cut one more piece, you put glue all over that, you rip the other piece in half, and you put it over that piece with the gap 180 degrees from where the other gap was to help kind of blend the roundness and then you repeat the process by cutting little wedge shaped pieces to fill the much bigger gap that was formed on the third ply that you put on there and again you band it really tight to help it conform to the previous profile of the, the inner parts so once you get all that done, and like I said, this took me all day, then I start attacking it with a foil tape. Guys, when you're ramming refractory, you cannot have any porous surface in contact with the, with the refractory as it is curing. It will absorb moisture out prematurely, and it will have, it will create very chalky, loose refractory. You don't want that. You want this stuff as hard as cement. So, uh, in order to do that, you have to waterproof the core. So, you're looking at about <laughs> six plies of foil tape. Now, it's not necessarily just to drive off the moisture. I'm trying to blend out the roughness of the, the mess that I got glued up here as well because... What I'm going to do prior to pouring this is I'm going to put Vaseline all over it and hopefully we'll be able to salvage the core and use it later. Just because, you know, it, it takes so long just to make the core. Alright, so I have it setting on a half inch steel plate and the plate is slightly backwards. It's running downhill to the back. Well, that's the tap hole and once we uh, get ready to ram the refractory, I'm going to have a piece of PVC pipe 
It's it, it's that exact size. Well, it's a little little bigger, but I'm gonna have it inserted through that hole, and it's gonna butt up. And this is looking from the inside, so that I'm gonna have a piece of pipe that's gonna go through that hole and be siliconed, and it's gonna butt right up to the core here. The axis of this tapered core is kind of leaning that way, so I'm gonna have to cut some blocks of wood equally spaced and put in between the top here to keep it, keep the axis of it perpendicular to the outside of the furnace. And to keep it concentric up here to the top, we're gonna have three inches of refractory all along, all the way around the perimeter. We've covered that part of it, now we have to have our twir. And I finally have the profile the way I want it here. That's gonna come through right here and it's gonna be connected to the core. I'm gonna make the twir just a little bit bigger. I've been sanding on this for about 30 minutes and I finally got it where I want it. I may hit it just a little more. I do see a little bit of a gap. So this is gonna be held in place by a lid. Right out here. So as you can see, I gotta mark the length of my pipe and go ahead and cut it. And it's gotta be square. And it's gonna be bolted to a lid that's gonna be siliconed on down here. Once we get all that in place, hopefully it'll be sometime tonight, it may be tomorrow. Man, that rain's coming down pretty good. I'm sorry, I apologize for the background noise. But once we get that done, we will be able to round this along with the other furnace tonight, hopefully. And uh, then we'll be able to focus on making the lid. While we're making the lid, of course, this is going to continue to stay in there. We're going to have a cover. I've got a cover that I use each time for this, and it leaves a hemisphere in the lid. Now, on the next furnace, we're going to actually have... Up here at the top, we're gonna have a duct that goes down and comes out the outside of the furnace and goes back in, and it's gonna have a venturi effect that's gonna help pull these hot gases that are superheated through the duct and back into the burner again to help uh, with the fuel efficiency along with the heat. That's gonna be a long drug out process and you can't do that with a regular pipe, guys. It'll melt on it. It'll, <laughs> it won't last but about 10 minutes once the thing gets up to temp. So it's gonna have to be a refractory material that'll handle it. But anyway, I just wanted to show you where we're at on this. Well guys, I wanted to sh do a little box opening here. Uh, we had to move the spindle over here into the corner by the coil. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm gonna cover that up before we start using this again. I've been using it quite a bit now. It's, Mr. Pete gave me the phase converter I'm powering this with. I have had a lot of uses for it. Uh, it's, it's a very handy tool to have. But anyway, this box was sent to me by Steve, a subscriber of mine, and before I open this and tell you about it, let me tell you a little about Steve. Steve has a very interesting past. Steve has uh, built horse-drawn vehicles back in the 70s and 80s. And I was just talking to Josie not too long ago about how cool it would be if she and I could rely on just a horse and buggy to do the things we do. And 95% of our road trips involve going to the dollar store or to the cracker station which is a little farther but anyway yeah i thought that was pretty cool that uh he used to to do that as an earlier part of his career but he was kind enough to provide an inverter he asked me if i could use and i said i sure could because i have other uses for the uh phase converter mr pete gave me that are probably a little overkill for just using on the spindle sander plus this is an inverter with variable speed. So I can adjust my spindle speed with that knob. And, you know, I got my regular on and off button here to uh, switch the thing on and off. 
So you guys chime in. Yes, I do read your comments. I apologize for not replying, but it's I, I, I do read them. So I know several of you will be able to tell me whether I can do this or not, but my idea is to completely do away with this control box and replace it with this one. And, or do I still need to keep a main disconnect on the machine with that right beside it? That's my question. Uh, no, trust me, I will not try to wire this. I don't want to fry anything. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're simply going to be going from a switch box with a simple red and green button on it to an inverter that's got the same buttons on it along with the speed control. So, Steve, if you're listening, uh, I do appreciate this. This is going to come in very, uh, I will definitely be able to use it. I'm probably going to have my brother. He's more electrical savvy than myself. I'll probably have him come down here and he's also one that actually reads instructions which are included here I think we'll be able to figure it out but I just wanted to uh, oh you know what we this is speaking of box openings I forgot all about this uh, this is a job Keith's gonna need luckily he said this got put on hold but I need to open it because I didn't forget what it was speaking of Keith he he uh, He's going to be out of commission for a while. Well, he put the tape on it, didn't he? Okay, this is for the Vulcan engine crosshead gib. Okay, so that's going to be the pattern. I'll need two. All right. Oh, here's another one. We got his money's worth in shipping on this, didn't he? Got a split pattern. And this is the core box. Alright, so we'll keep that together. Now I gotta figure out what he... <laughs> He drove a nail in here, and then he shot torque screws in it. Let me get my drill. That's just a little too small. I don't have my eyeglasses, so I can't see. That's not it. Those are square anyway. There, there we go. Finally. I hope Keith <laughs> I hope Keith doesn't have three different size torques here. Bronze. 
So that's the bronze we're going to be using for the Gibbs. Notice he put the arrows all to one side, and that way I won't mismatch it. Huh, that's... I know Keith wouldn't do this, but you can't see the draft angle until you put some calipers on that side. See that? So there's plenty of draft angle there. And we should have the same thing here on the top half. Yep. All right. She's going to be recovering from a surgical procedure for a while. <laughs> I'm not going to put all that back in there like that. Uh, we're going to wrap the gib back up. And it's hard to tell on the camera, but you got plenty of draft angle here, here, and on the inside. And he's got a really nice thick gusset or fillet. The well, Keith didn't trust the uh, postal service too well. He went through the effort to custom fit this box and make a little wooden crate out of it. I had to do that on something one time. But I use the <laughs> I use the same fasteners for everything. Anyway. Now I remember what that was. Try to pack it back up. I got quite a bit of packaging material. Well, my friends, I'm going to let you go right here. Uh, next week, we will show some of the uh, ramming of the refractory, getting all that and the lids done, and try to get these projects up and burning soon. You know, it, I, I said it's going to take about two weeks. That's about, so far, I've got about one week tied up just into this point between chiseling out the refractory, getting everything sealed off, which Josie did her the credit for that. But uh, anyway, y'all take care as far as the background noise. The weather has been really bad here, uh, but it's affecting everybody from the coast all the way to Canada. By the time you see this video, I'm sure the weather will be a lot better. I hope. <laughs> uh, I've been adjusting quite well to this 75 degree temp in December, and now it's going to be dropping down into the 40s and 50s. But anyway, take it easy, and I'll talk to y'all later. This well, is what happens when you send a bad pattern to Clark. He makes <laughs> you come out here and sand it and fix your mistakes. There you go. Yep, at least you're here to do it. Most of them I have to send them back. But uh, you got Steve Watkins out here slaving away on the lap board trying to get the high spots out of the pattern. We've already rammed the one that I showed you a second ago and it almost didn't come out of there. But as you as Steve is noticing, all the high spots now. It didn't look that bad until no. till you start taking that down. I was proud of it until <laughs> you saw how much problems it now was. You understand, now you're able to see why it didn't come out as easily as you thought it would. Uh, there is a lot of... That, that lap board shows the evidence. And I'll zoom in. Hold that angle right there and let me show. Just hold it still. You can lay it on the table and I can zoom in. And, all right light will reflect on it better this thing zooms pretty good and that was after sanding it and three coats of high bill primer yep and it's yep it's still that bad i know yep it is uh it can be a pain this and is it, all don's fault <laughs> as i tell everybody the profile of the surface and and the way we're having to ram this these this is sitting in the mold like this or upside down like this. and uh, so if you've got a few thousands uh, up and down on the actual surface profile that sand's going to grab it every time 
You you beat on it for ten minutes trying to get it out of there. Yeah, at least. And uh, I was scared we were going to destroy the mold just trying to pull it out. But next time will go a lot better because now you see the I see what we the you see what we have to do. Ways. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're, I'm fixing to get back to the skillet. For those who have been asking about the Windy Hill Foundry hats, these are now available on my website, windyhillfoundry.com, under stores, or you can click on the above link. These are on the pricey side, but keep in mind the shipping is included. Have a good day.